All right, so this next idea is really just the idea of conservation of energy rehashed dealing with only thermal energy, so uh, kind of zeroing in on thermal energy, but it's still conservation of energy. Thermal energy is conserved in a closed system. What I mean by closed system here is that uh, no thermal energy is lost to the outside environment. Right. Energy is conserved no matter what. We're not losing, we're not creating or destroying any energy as long as we don't get into nuclear right now, uh, in essence. We'll, we'll leave that for later, that discussion for later. Um, so all energy is conserved, meaning that it's not lost or destroyed, it just transfers from one object to another. Now, it's very difficult to uh, deal with the entire environment around the air and, and the ground and everything else in your environment. Um, if we uh, have to let thermal energy escape into that, because there is no specific heat, uh, C, right, for the environment. There, there's too many objects, there's too much going on there. Um, to an extent, we can deal with the air around an object, but that's really hard because the mass of the air, it starts to distribute, right, it starts to spread that heat out over the entire air, which then goes into the atmosphere and it, it becomes nasty and hairy. So closed system, basically, let's leave the environment out. Sum of all my thermal energies equals zero, right? Sum of all my thermal energies equals zero. Now be very careful because something gaining thermal energy is going to get a positive delta Q and something losing thermal energy, giving it up, is going to get a negative delta Q. You're actually not going to have to deal with that though if you're breaking it down uh, in the positive and negative delta Qs because your delta T uh, T final minus T initial, will deal with the sign for you. You'll see that here in a second. Thermal equilibrium is uh, when objects have the same temperature. In other words, whenever something is in equilibrium, they're balanced out. That, that's another way to explain equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium is when objects have the same temperature. So uh, if I have a, uh, like in this problem down here, some metal at 100 degrees Celsius, and I put it in water, room temperature, we generally take to be 20 or 21 degrees Celsius, and then they, uh, it sits in there for a little while, the water warms up, the metal cools down, and we reach an equilibrium te temperature in this problem of 48 degrees Celsius. So that's equilibrium at that point in time, because temperature is the same, no thermal energy is continuing to move, right? There, there's no heat anymore moving between the two uh, transfer of thermal energy. Because remember, thermal energy always flows heat from hot to cold. So if we're at the same temperature, there's no flow of thermal energy. All right, so let me work this problem for you. A 350 gram unknown metal is heated up to 100 degrees Celsius. By the way, that's generally done uh, by placing a metal in boiling water because boiling water uh, is going to have a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, pretty close, right? Um, 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, you leave the metal in there for a good while and uh, the metal will eventually warm up to be the exact same temperature as the water around. So you, you might have to leave it in there for a while in the boiling water, but that's how you get your metal at exactly 100 degrees Celsius. We stick it in a calorimeter. Um, a calorimeter is just a container, okay? It's just a container, um, but it's, spe it's specifically a container that does a really good job of not letting thermal energy escape into the environment. It keeps all that thermal energy in, meaning this is a closed system. Uh, so we put it in a calorimeter uh, that has 750 grams of room temperature water in it. After allowing the objects to come to equilibrium, the temperature of the water now is 48 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat capacity of this metal? And the reason that this is a very useful thing is, remember, every single uh, element and every single compound has its own unique specific heat. Uh, so and those things are known, they've already been experimented on it and figured out. So then once you figure out the specific heat of some unknown metal, you can go reference a uh, table in a book somewhere or, or the internet and figure out what type of metal, metal or object you're dealing with. So let's set this problem up now. So what I can tell you is delta Q of my metal plus delta Q of the water has to equal zero. Sum of all the uh, exchanges in thermal energy, gaining and losing thermal energy, has to equal zero. By the way, if we had to deal with the calorimeter, because um, the calorimeter or the cup or the container is technically going to absorb a little bit of heat, we would put that as a third delta Q, right? You know, delta Q of the maybe 
cal or calorimeter. But here, since uh, we're saying that assume, no, notice the last uh, statement here, assume no energy lost to the calorimeter, we don't have to deal with delta Q of the calorimeter. Every time you see delta Q, it breaks down into MCAT. So I've got mass of my metal, specific heat of my metal, and then delta T, right, of the metal, plus uh, mass of the water, specific heat of my water, and delta T of the water, right, equals zero. And delta T is final minus initial. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute in some numbers and talk about that. All right, so I substituted in mass of metal, specific heat of metal is what I'm looking for, right, lowercase c, specific heat, and then my M for metal. Now, delta T is final temperature minus initial temperature. And now think about the metal. The metal was initially at 100 degrees Celsius. It was heated up to that. Then it's placed in the water, and because of that, it cools down to a final of 48. So final minus initial for the metal is going to be 48 minus 100, a.k.a. if you look at this, right, this will come out to be negative, meaning this is going to be negative. The metal is losing thermal energy, which is true. It's cooling down, right? It's giving that heat, though, to the water over here. So here's my mass of water. A uh, specific heat of water, you know, is 4,187 uh, joules per kilogram Kelvin. And then final, the water warmed up to 48 degrees and started out at room temperature, which we take to be 21 degrees. You'll see it sometimes being 20 degrees in books, things like that. But 21 degrees is what we're taking it to be. So be careful with your final minus your initial uh, with temperatures. That's what will give you the negative or the positive, whether these objects are gaining or losing heat. So now I'm just going to go ahead and start plugging things through the calculator. So I come out with a specific heat for the metal of 4,700 joules per kilogram Kelvin, two sig figs, because of my 48 degrees here, even though I had three, 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 two sig figs there, so I can only go to two significant figures. This is actually a, an, an unrealistic number whenever you go through that, uh, because water has an absolutely massive uh, specific heat capacity, and there really isn't much that we have on our world that has a specific heat capacity that high. It's very, very rare to actually find a metal over 1,000 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Um, most of them are somewhere between, you know, somewhere around 500, 600, 700, somewhere in there. Plus, we had a lot more water. So, in essence, whenever I was writing this problem, that equilibrium temperature was too high. It shouldn't have warmed the water up that much. Anyway, let's say this is real. Let's say that my 4,700 joules per kilogram Kelvin is real. Well, now I have a specific heat. I can open up a book. Your textbook will be just fine. You pull up a reference table. There's one in the thermal energy chapter, and you compare it to that, and you can tell what type of metal you have. Um, Whenever doing this in a lab form, which you'll be doing in my class, you're going to want to make sure that you read your thermometer and you get your masses with as much precision as possible. Get as many significant figures in there as possible. Um, the reason for that is two sig figs isn't necessarily going to work in a lab because some metals are, have specific heats that are different but are very close to each other. For example, maybe one has a specific heat of 551, whereas a different one has a specific heat of 559. So if you don't have three significant figures, you might not be able to see the difference between the two. All right, so I'll see you in class. We'll talk about this a little bit more, maybe go over this in lab and uh, work some problems.